Hello everyone. Today we'll be starting our series on hyponatremia and in next few lectures we'll understand how sodium is regulated in the body and we'll be able to work up hyponatremia in a much easier way. So let's start with some basic concepts. Everybody knows what serum osmolality is. One of the things that we commonly interchange is osmolarity and osmolality. However, in medicine, these two numbers are approximately the same, so don't worry about it. One of them is number of moles in liter of solute, and other is number of moles in kg of solute. Uh, since we use water in most of the human physiology, these numbers are approximately equal. Osmolality would depend upon the number of molecules, and if the molecules are larger, they will contribute much less to the osmolarity. The higher the molecular weight, your number of molecules will be lower despite higher weight of the substance present. So for example, albumin has a very high molecular weight of around 66,000 Daltons. And even though it's present in 4 gram per deciliter, it only contributes to 0.6 millimole per liter. Just for comparison, this is the size of albumin molecule while sodium molecule is possibly similar to one of these red dots here. Total osmolality will depend upon the total number of molecules and atoms present in the solution. In plasma, there is sodium, potassium, magnesium and calcium salts along with glucose and urea. So plasma osmolality is 2 times sodium plus glucose by 18 plus urea by 2.8. The reason it is twice the sodium is because there are equal number of negative ions to neutralize the positive ions. One of the questions that you will be wondering is where do we get these numbers 18 and 2.8 from? These numbers are nothing but molecular weight of glucose and urea respectively. If you remember the molar concentration is nothing but weight in milligram per dl which is usually what we use to measure glucose and urea divided by molecular weight and divided by 10. Now glucose contributes to around 5 milliosmol per liter in most of the condition. So effective plasma osmolality is nothing but twice into sodium concentration. One of the things that you'll be wondering is why did we not talk about urea in this situation? So let's talk about another term called tonicity which is effective osmolality. That means if that molecule affects water movement across a semi-permeable membrane. We have got two cells here. This cell has glucose and sodium outside. You know that glucose needs a transporter to enter the cells under the influence of insulin. Sodium cannot enter the cell because it's positively charged. The blue dots represent water. We have another cell with urea outside. Since sodium and glucose cannot enter the cell, the water is going to move outside this semi-permeable cell membrane. However, in the case of urea, urea is a neutral molecule, so it's able to enter the cell easily. So urea is going to redistribute inside and outside the cell, and it will not result in any effective movement of water. So in a way, urea is an ineffective osmol. So plasma tonicity is governed by level of sodium and glucose only. One of the important concepts to understand in this is effective circulating volume. This is actually a pressure that is perfusing the arterial baroreceptor in your carotid and aortic bodies and decline in this pressure will result in responses toward sodium retention and again the important word is pressure and not volume. We have three examples. One of them is a volume depleted subject second is a heart failure and third person is a cirrhotic patient and you can see that your effective circulatory pressure depends upon the three characteristics your plasma volume cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance your ecf volume unfortunately does not have any effect on your effective circulating volume in sodium depleted subject your plasma volume and cardiac output is low however your svr is high and you can understand that low volume and cardiac output are going to stimulate your baroreceptors. In heart failure, your plasma volume is up and your SVR is up. However, the cardiac output is down and that's being sensed by the baroreceptors. 
in patients with cirrhotic, your plasma volume and cardiac output are pretty good. However, because of very low systemic vessel resistance, these baroreceptors are feeling lower pressure and they're stimulated. One of the things that you have to understand, it's very difficult to assess accurate volume status of an individual. So it is better to use labs like urine sodium and urine urea to figure this out because these responses are being sensed by your baroreceptors and they are determining if you have sufficient effective circulatory volume or not. So a urine sodium of less than 20 or phenol less than 1% would suggest that the person's effective circulatory volume is lower. If the patient is on diuretics, you can use Fe urea to figure that out. Everybody has seen this diagram and this is the regulation of your effective circulatory volume. And whenever your ECV drops, you stimulate your sympathetic system and your renin angiotensin system as well, which results in aldosterone stimulation. And this would result in sodium absorption. It will also stimulate your ADH response, which will result in your peripheral vasoconstriction and increased water reabsorption. I would suggest to understand this flowchart very well, as it's going to help you in multiple other situations besides hyponatremia. So let's see how aldosterone works. Aldosterone works in distal convoluted tubules and early collecting ducts. We have got sodium potassium ATPs, which can pump two potassium and three sodium. We have got a potassium channel on the luminal side and we have sodium channels on the luminal side. Aldosterone stimulates all these three channels. So your sodium potassium ATPs channels are much higher on the capillary side and you have increased potassium and sodium channels on the luminal side. So because of your increased potassium and sodium channels, both potassium and sodium will move across their osmotic gradient. And with the aid of sodium potassium ATPs, that sodium that has entered will be exchanged for the potassium in the capillary. Because you're absorbing sodium, the water will passively follow that and you will have one of the things to remember in this is your distal convoluted tubules are highly permeable to water and the water should be able to exchange freely between the luminal and capillary side. Now ADH works in the distal collecting ducts where they don't allow free water to pass through. The only way you can allow the water to pass through is aquaporin channels which are stimulated by ADH. So once we have ADH in your system, you will have aquaporin channels exposed on the luminal side, which will allow the water to pass through through the osmotic gradient. Thus you will have decreased osmolality and increased effective circulating volume because of ADH response. Hypovolemia is a less sensitive stimulus for ADH release than aldosterone. So as your blood volume drops, the body will prioritize volume over osmolality when there's a significant decrease in the intravascular volume. Plasma osmolality is the strongest stimulation for ADH. And as your plasma osmolality rises, your levels of ADH are higher. If your plasma osmolality falls below 280, the production of ADH stops almost completely. One of the things to remember is ADH only affects water and not the solid excretion because the distal collecting ducts are impervious to water and salt. The aldosterone works on the distal convoluted tubule and proximal collecting duct where these cells are easily permeable to water and as you absorb sodium, the water follows through so your osmolality does not change. Aldosterone will maintain volume without any change in osmolality. ADH works on the distal collecting duct which are impervious to water unless aquaporin is present and it only absorbs free water. So it reduces osmolality, which can cause hyponatremia. So ADH also maintains volume, but at a cost of osmolality. Let's say you are exercising on a hot day and you're sweating a lot. So your ECV is going to drop. And since you're losing more free water, sweat does not have a lot of salt in it. Your plasma osmolality is going to increase your decrease ECV is going to stimulate your stress receptor in your aorta and carotid bodies, which will lead to 
activation of renin angiotensin system and aldosterone and this will result in sodium reabsorption and try to correct your ECV. Your increased plasma osmolality is going to stimulate ADH release which is going to cause more free water absorption and tries to correct the serum osmolality. So you are going to make highly concentrated urine with low sodium. To correct this, you need something to increase the ECV and decrease the serum osmolality. If you give D5, which is a good way to improve your serum osmolality, but not the best way to increase your ECV. While normal saline is great at increasing your ECV, but not a good way to decrease serum osmolality. So half normal saline will be the optimal fluid in this scenario. Let's say you ate a lot of chips, which is rich in sodium chloride. This is going to increase your plasma osmolality, so it will draw fluid from your intracellular compartment. Increase ECV is going to inhibit the stress receptor and stimulate your ANP pathway, which will result in sodium loss, thereby reducing the ECV. However, the increased plasma osmolality is going to stimulate your ADH system and will result in free water absorption. This will result in a highly concentrated urine with high sodium. So in this scenario, you will, you will give them D5, which will drop the plasma osmolality. Dropping the plasma osmolality is going to get the water back in the intracellular compartment and reduce your ECV. This will also stimulate your thirst response. That's why you want to drink a lot of water and not get rid of the eating chips. So try to look for volume regulation along with osmo regulation whenever you are treating your patients. One of the differences that you need to know is difference between dehydration and volume depletion. Dehydration usually means water loss that would result in higher sodium and osmotic movement of water out of the cells. While volume depletion means that you are losing salt and water pretty much equally, so you have decreased extracellular fluid. So in summary, aldosterone is stimulated by low effective circulating volume and causes sodium reabsorption and water will follow it and there will be no change in serum osmolality. ADH is stimulated by both serum osmolality and low ECV and will result in preferential absorption of water and will decrease your serum osmolality. There's a very good physiological discussion on this on Khan Academy. Please look at the link below. This is possibly one of the better explanation that I've seen. Thank you.